Welcome everyone, we have a fun video today. One of the things that I keep track of, this happens twice a year, is this teen survey. It's a survey given to thousands of teenagers across the US, and the goal of it is to get insights into their spending habits. What type of companies they value? What type of brands they value? Are they shopping online or in stores, right? There's a lot of different good insights that I think we can derive from this survey. And this one in particular, has some unique changes from this survey to the last one. So things are changing with teen spending habits. And we're gonna go through all of it together. So I'll go through it with you. I think that'll be a lot of fun. We're also, of course, gonna be looking at my portfolio, the story fund. In fact, let's go ahead and start off here. Today was a particularly tough day in the market. There's a big sell-off. My portfolio is down 3% just today. Almost every company, it doesn't matter, is down in the red. Amazon, all the software companies, Netflix, Google, so on and so forth. Literally every company's in the red. So this is not anything that has to do with any company uniquely. This is just a broad market sell-off. And this is because of the Fed meetings. The Fed is taking a much more aggressive stance on quantitative tightening, on raising interest rates. And I think they're trying to spook the market. But that's a subject for a different time. This is a lot of macro events that affect the portfolios in the short term, but over the long term, the performance will depend on how these companies do, whether they grow massively and become more profitable or whether they stagnate. So either way, I'm gonna be tracking the performance of this portfolio week by week, and I'll benchmark it against the S&P 500. This is what it looks like right now. We're still trailing the S&P 500 by around the same amount we have for the past two months. So. We haven't really made up any ground or lost any ground. We're still around that 10% behind it, but I'll keep you updated with this. Again, the goal is to outperform the S&P 500 by the end of 2025. Now, moving on, in my portfolio, I focus on a lot of what I consider to be fundamentally strong companies, meaning that they have free cash flow, they have net income, they have very good balance sheets, and so on and so forth. But beyond that, I also try to focus on companies that have qualitative characteristics about them that I think are also very strong. These aren't just companies, these are brands. They provide value to consumers. And I try to consider my investments through the lens of a consumer as well, not just an investor. Meaning how much value does this company bring the average consumer? For example, I think of the actual value that Amazon brings to its consumers, and I think it's substantial. I think that customers very much like the value proposition that Amazon brings them. And I'd say the same thing about Netflix with the viewing time that they have. I say the same thing about Google with YouTube. I think it brings immense value and so on and so forth. All of these companies are brands, they're products, and they have strong relationships with their customers. Now on that subject, I think it's important to look and see if companies are gaining brand value and gaining a better connection with customers or losing it. And that's part of what this survey does. This is the Piper Sandler 43rd survey. They surveyed 7,100 teens, which you might say that's not every teen in the US, right? That's 7,000 of millions, but that is a pretty significant sampling size. That gives us a very good overview. The first thing that we can highlight is the average household income is 69,300 which seems pretty high. Household incomes have really grown. So it's good to see that. We see healthy household incomes. But let's go ahead and see which brands are important. The first big insight that I got from this survey that I think is very meaningful is for payment apps. Typically, every single year, Venmo has come out on top. Venmo has been number one for teens with payment apps. But now Apple Pay, for the first time, ranked first, partly due to 87% of teens in the survey saying they now have an iPhone. So Apple, once again, shows the power of their ecosystem. Because they own the platform, they have Apple Pay as just one of the default options. It's very easy to use. It's pretty much the same thing as Venmo, but you don't have to go to a third-party app. This is incredible. And this is part of the reason why I exited out of every single thing I consider to be fintech, all of them. I sold MasterCard, I sold Visa, I sold PayPal, I sold Square. I got out of every single one of them. Because in my opinion, the space is so crowded. There's so many fintech players all of them are competing, and I think the companies that already have inherent advantages like Apple will leverage their advantage to win in things like Apple Pay. I see Apple being a massive fintech player in the future, way more than they are already. Now they say Venmo ranked number two, PayPal number four, and Square's Cash App number three. So these are still obviously big players, Cash App and Venmo, but now they're competing with a new entrant, which is Apple. Now moving on, let's go ahead and jump into some of these lists of the top used brands and websites. The first one is the top shopping websites amongst teens. 
This one I think is also a little bit surprising. We know that Amazon would probably win, right? Most people know that every single age group, Amazon dominates in online retail. And it's no surprise that Amazon dominates amongst teens as well. But what is surprising is they control 53% market share amongst teens, and the next closest is 8%. Sheen at 8%. Then we have Nike at 6% and PacSun at 2%. So this gives you an idea of why I have Amazon as my top holding, not just amongst millennials or uh, boomers or teens, whatever. Every single generation, Amazon dominates online retail and there's no close competitor. Walmart.com, Target.com, they're not close to Amazon. They're not even ballpark close. And we see the same thing here. Now, after that, we can look at the top clothing brands here. This is a little bit surprising to me as well. It's not surprising that Nike came out number one with 30%. I think that's a given. Nike is incredibly popular amongst teens and adults alike. But American Eagle in second place, this is a brand that I think is very much a teenager brand. This is one that I think you see in high schools. It was even popular back when I was in high school, but I don't see many millennials or older people wearing American Eagle. So I think this is one that they'll probably grow out of and move into the camp of Lululemon, H&M, Adidas, and so on and so forth. So I see Lululemon and H&M struggling with teenagers. They're not getting that crowd, but they'll probably get more market share as they get older. But right now, Nike's doing it across every age group. So Nike is winning the top clothing brands category here. Then we have beauty destinations. This one I think is very interesting. The top winner is Ulta Beauty at 48%. And this is a company that just spoiler alert, I'm very interested in. It might make an appearance in one of my portfolios soon. Ulta Beauty is an incredibly solid company, great fundamentals, and it is obviously winning market share over other competitors. They have 48% amongst teens. Then we have Sephora at 20%, Target at 9%. By the way, Target has an agreement with Ulta Beauty, much like, much like they do with Starbucks to have many of them in their stores. So they're doing that with their relationship. Then we have Walmart at 6% and Amazon at 4%. So in the beauty category, Walmart, Target, and Amazon make up a very small share. And I think that that makes sense. Most people won't buy premium beauty products on Amazon because they're not any cheaper. These brands keep their prices the exact same on Amazon or in Ulta. If you buy on Amazon, you're not positive it's not a counterfeit. They have that issue. So many people go into stores like Ulta to buy these beauty products. So I think that Ulta and Sephora and Target in person will always have an advantage. And there's more on that subject I could talk about, but that's one of the major reveals here is Ulta still keeps its top spot. After that, we have the top cosmetic brands. We have e.l.f. at 13%, Maybelline at 11%. I think that's Tart. I don't know how to say that. At 8%, L'Oreal, and then Morph at 4%. So these companies, I think, are important to look at if you're investing in them individually. But I like to own the distributor more than individual companies. In most cases, I like owning the platform of distribution. So instead of looking at lots of separate brands, I'd rather own Costco that aggregates all the brands in a platform and sells all of them. Or the Ulta that aggregates all the brands, sells them in one distribution center. And the same thing with Amazon and so on and so forth. So if you're looking at these individual companies, there's certainly value to be had there, but it's just a different thing to look at. The top skincare brands are CeraVe at 41%. That one wins out huge. Then we have Cetaphil at 8%. So this is another one where we have one dominant player in the game. Then the Ordinary at 6%. Neutrogena at 6% and Curology at 2%. So basically the market's controlled by the top dog here. Now moving on, we have the category of shoes. This is a massive industry, both for teenagers and adults. And the top brand, of course, is Nike. They always win this category. And I think they'll continue to win it for the long-term foreseeable future. Nike has such a good marketing team. They have such a good digital team. They moved everything away from Amazon, which many people were concerned about that they would lose sales. Then they created their own app that is top notch. It has all your stuff saved. They do drops, which create artificial scarcity. So they'll drop a really good looking shoe. There's only a limited amount. You have to buy it right then. You have free returns, no hassle. Uh, it's just a very good marketing team. Nike is on top of it. So in my opinion, Nike is doing all the right moves and I think it's a very solid stock. After that, we have 8% shared with Converse. So, so far, Nike dominates this market 
more than any other com company dominates the market with 60% market share. Then the next is 8% Converse, Adidas at 8%, Vans at 8%. So all of them are basically tied. And then New Balance at 1%. After shoes, we go on to handbags. We have Coach at 17%, Michael Kors at 15%, Louis Vuitton at 14%, and Kate Spade at 12% and Chanel at 6%. This is much more evenly spread. Not any one company dominates the handbag industry. I think that's interesting to see. Now, I'm not too interested in any of these companies or these stocks, whatever owns them. So that's one that I kind of ignore, but I am very interested in the technology and social media category. In daily video consumption, we have Netflix still on top with 30% share of daily video consumption. I think that's against what a lot of people assume. They think that Netflix is dying out to competition. We have all these other streaming services coming in, all these new entrants, and Netflix is going to be just a small fish in the pond, right? I don't think that's the case. Netflix has so much video consumption time amongst every age group, elderly people, millennials, they have young people watching different shows. They even have kids watching lots of their kids' content. In fact, my kids probably spend more time watching Netflix than Disney Plus just because there's so much to watch on it. So Netflix, as of right now, still remains the top streaming service in terms of video consumption amongst teens. Then we have YouTube, a little bit different category, but that also consumes 30%. So between these two, these two companies, which I have significant bets into both of them, they control each 60% of teens video consumption time. That is pretty impressive. After that, we have Hulu making ground with 8%. That's owned by Disney. Now moving on to the social media category, notice that they put YouTube in the video category and TikTok in the social media category. This could be argued, you could make arguments either way, but I think this is mostly accurate. TikTok wins out by a slim margin in number one with 33% market share. Then we have Snapchat with 31% and then Instagram with 22%. See, this is the reason that I think some investors are concerned about Facebook. It's because Meta controls Instagram and Facebook.com and Instagram is currently lagging behind Snapchat and TikTok. So if you're invested in Meta, I don't think this is like an end dollar or anything, but it's something to consider in the investment thesis. So far, there's other platforms that teens are spending more time on. They're spending more time on Netflix and YouTube and Hulu and TikTok and Snapchat. And so far, Instagram is the only app that's really consuming a lot of teens time. If you move up into the older age groups, you'll get a lot more share of facebook.com. So this is very much a teen specific thing. Now, if we look at social causes, on the minds of teens, Ukraine is number one with a 13% share. Then we have the environment with 11%, racial equality at 10%, gas prices at 10%. So gas prices are now tied with racial equality. That's how much higher gas prices really get into people's minds. And then after that is 4% with inflation. So even teens, teenagers are concerned about inflation. Pretty incredible to see. Let's go ahead and look at foods here. This is one that is not surprising. I know this list pretty well, and it stayed mostly the same. Chick-fil-A number one, without a doubt. This one has been winning. Teens love Chick-fil-A. It has great chicken. I agree with them on this one. We have Chipotle number two at 14%. This is one that has moved up the list. Then we have Starbucks at number three with 13%. I have a holding in Starbucks. Part of my investment thesis is that people like Starbucks. It has incredible brand value. That's part of what draws people to it. Then after that, we have a pretty big disparity there. It goes from 13% to 4% with McDonald's at 4% and then Duncan at 3%. So you have Chick-fil-A with the majority, then Chipotle, then Starbucks, then a pretty big drop off to McDonald's and Duncan. Now moving on, we have the top snacks. This one is actually surprising to me. Goldfish is number one. Number one for teenagers is goldfish. I would not have guessed that, but it's at 11%. Goldfish, I looked it up, it's owned by the Campbell's Soup Company. So that's the one that owns them. Then we have Lay's, which is owned by Pepsi at 10%. Cheez-Its is owned by the Kellogg's Company, and that's at 9%. Then we have Doritos, which again is owned by Pepsi. That's at 6%. And then Cheetos, which I also believe is owned by Pepsi at 4%. So across the board, if you were to add this up, Pepsi owns Lay's, Doritos, and Cheez-Its which makes up majority share. So if you're gonna invest in one company that teens like the majority of snacks, it would be Pepsi. Now top celebrities, this is a category I think is funny. We have Ryan Reynolds at number one, which is not surprising at all. Ryan Reynolds has a YouTube channel where he mostly shows commercials that they get like hundreds of thousands or millions of views for him advertising stuff. 
So people go to his channel to watch and seek out commercials with Ryan Reynolds. When you have people going to you to watch a commercial, that means that you have you have influence. You are a top celebrity at that point. Then we have uh, Zendaya, we have Kanye West, Dwayne Johnson, Taylor Swift. So those are your top celebrities. Now we have the top influencers, which I'm not entirely certain the difference between top celebrities and influencers. I think it's like celebrities, I think are more like movies and TV shows. Influencers, I think are more social media would be my guess. But we have Emma Chamberlain, Kanye West, Dwayne Johnson, Zendaya, and Jadion. I don't know about half of those, but there's your top influencers. So there you have it. There's the breakdown of what's important to teens and where they're spending their money. I think what this shows overall is a lot of continuity. I've been following this survey every six months for years. And what I notice is that things don't change that much. Teens like doing the same thing six months ago that they do now. And that's pretty consistent every single year. These brands move up and down the list a little bit. They might move up a couple percentage. Some might beat out others here and there. But it's pretty incredible how strong brand value is. The same names stay on the top for year after year after year. We see companies like Nike keeping their brands on the very top for a very long time. So when I look at investments, I try to determine which ones have the meaningful brand value, which ones are going to keep that brand value for a very long time. And I think that's important to look at. So I hope you enjoyed the video. Let me know what you think, and I'll see you in the next one.